Okay, um, welcome everyone to the American Cetacean Society, San Francisco Bay Chapters May speaker event for 2023. I'm Susan Hopp, board member in charge of our speaker program, and I'm here with fellow board member, Wade Cobb. First of all, for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, we are a chapter within a national organization uh, that is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and um, our grant program. So we appreciate your donations in support of our mission. And we are recording um, this. Hold on just one second. Yes, we are recording um, this session, and we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A, uh, not the chat. And after the presentation, we'll do our best uh, to get to all those questions. And now for our subject at hand. So tonight we are traveling to the far reaches of our planet to Svalbard, a Norwegian archipelago north of the Arctic Circle. Our tour guide is award-winning photographer and whale researcher, Jody Fridiani, who will take us up close and personal to this wild land of wild ice and of truly wild life. We're lucky to have Jody, who is becoming a regular and an immensely popular ACS speaker uh, so that we can share in her travels. So a little bit about Jody. She's based in Santa Cruz, her photographic adventures have taken her around the world to Africa, Alaska, Argentina, Antarctica, Brazil, Norway, Siberia, Thailand, Tonga, and to Dominican Republic, where for 22 years she has been swimming with and photographing humpback whales on the Silver Bank. Her work has appeared in a number of national and international publications, including the BBC's Nature's Weirdest Events and Carl Safina's National Geographic blog, Ocean Views. She's won prestigious awards in multiple international photo competitions, including Nature Photographer of the Year competition sponsored by the London Natural History Museum, and the Big Picture competition sponsored by the California Academy of Sciences. In addition to photographing wildlife in its many forms and habitats, Jody is engaged in whale research via Fluke ID projects, both here and abroad. With co-authors Nancy Black and Fred Sharp, she published her first paper in 2020 entitled Postmortem Attractions, Humpback Whales Investigate the Carcass of a Killer Whale Depredated Gray Whale Calf. Jody is currently collaborating on two additional papers about humpback whale bubble use. She's also engaged in humpback whale acoustic research in Southeast Alaska, where she participated in a three week boat based humpback whale research expedition in 2021 and will return again this August. We'll put in the chat where you can check out all of her photography, which is at jodyfridiani.com. And with that, uh, Jody, take it away. And thank you so much for being here. But thank you, Susan and ACS San Francisco chapter for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure to talk with you folks. And I terribly miss the in-person meetings, but Zoom provides the opportunity for people to show up from all over the place. So that's really wonderful. And um, I'm quite excited to be here this evening. So um, I'm going to take you on a journey through Svalbard and the photos in this presentation were all taken on a 2022 trip that um, I embarked on. So let's start out and, and see, um, are you guys seeing my, the little thing at the bottom of here that's from the, um, we're seeing the map. You're not, okay. You're not seeing the zoom, the zoom bar menu bar. Oh, okay, no. great. All right, so um, Susan told you a little bit about Svalbard. 
It's actually an, uh, a series of islands or an archipelago. Um, it's bordered by the Arctic Ocean, the Barents Sea, the Norwegian Sea, and the Greenland Sea. And it is um, it, it belongs to Norway or is under the sovereignty of Norway. It's about 600 miles north of the northern part of Norway and about halfway between Norway and the North Pole. So um, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, place and it's the northernmost place in the world with a permanent habitation. Uh, there are about 3000 people who live on Svalbard. Most of those live in Longyearbyen, um, which is where we're going to be starting the voyage, and uh, a few hundred actually live in a place called Barentsburg, which is actually a Russian, um, it's a, a Russian town or city. So, um, and and the reason that people can actually live there is be, due to the the um, sorry the, the the Gulf Stream, which actually brings water up there. Otherwise, it would be frozen solid all year round. So. Um, the trip I did was approximately two weeks. Uh, the first two days, um, I I came early and stayed in the city of Longyearbyen, which we'll learn a little bit more about. But it's where the red um, the red spot is on this map, and we were able to uh, over the next ten days circumnavigate the whole of uh, Spitsbergen, which is the the main island group of uh, of Svalbard. And that was pretty exciting. On the other hand, it has some, there's some drawbacks to that. And I'm just gonna take a moment to sort of talk about that because on the short term, it meant that it was ice-free enough that we could navigate around. Um, but if we look at these, these maps, and I've got a few series here um, from the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. Uh, the image on the left was the 1st of July in 2020. On the right is the 1st of July in 2022. And the most obvious thing that stands out are the red patches, and those are what's known as very close drift ice. So it's uh, we sometimes call it brash ice, drift ice. You can see there was a lot more of it in 2020 than there was in 2022. And then even more importantly, though, for our journey was what's called fast ice, which is the dark gray. And if you look, I hope you can see my cursor here um, in July of 2020, that that drift ice, the, the the close drift ice came right down towards the top of Spitsbergen, and there was a lot of the fast ice um, along the eastern northeastern border. So it would have been impossible to go there. Fast ice basically uh, it comes right up to the land. In July of 2022, July 1st, which is when I was there, there was none of either of those. So we were able to fully navigate, circumnavigate the whole island. Um, just a, another quick look here. In February of 2022, which was the February before I went there, look how much, look how much of the ice there was around the island. Um, just a huge amount compared to, um, and I can't actually see this myself, this year. So this year, there is a lot less of that drift ice and there was a lot of open water around it. So we can't make um, you know, generalizations based on two years, but we do know that we're seeing a lot less ice, the glaciers are melting, and um, it's, it's happening faster in the Arctic than it is elsewhere. So, why uh, does my cursor not, okay. So we'll start out in Longyearbyen, and I will apologize and say this is the worst photo that you'll see this evening. This one was taken with my old phone out of the plane window as we were arriving. Uh, it looks pretty bleak. It's not nearly as bleak. Uh, the ground actually is covered in grass. But if you realize that in the wintertime, um, they've got 24-7 without any sun for a period of time. And you can see here, it's not that bleak. These are some of the residential units and the, lots of grass. And this is the parking lot for the winter vehicles because you know, we've got 2,400 people there. I don't know that they're all there in the winter, but they get around by snowmobile. But there is a dark side to Longer Bend and that is the coal mining history. In 1917, uh, well, there was also a lot of resource extraction with hunting and stuff for several hundred years prior to that. But in 1917, as a result of World War I, there was a demand for coal 
and there are a lot of coal in, in Svalbard. So these towers uh, were from that period and that coal mining went on for a hundred years, originally started by the Swedes and then a lot of political upheaval and stuff. And these towers were used for transporting the coal from the mine down to the waterfront in, in buckets. And it looks something like this, it's kind of like ski lift. Um, here you can see how difficult that must have been in the winter time. But uh, in, in, 19, in 2017, basically um, all the coal mines shut down except for one that still provides uh, power for Svalbard itself. And the government of Norway shifted so that instead of coal mining being the primary industry, it's now tourism and research. So we're making progress on that front, but there's an irony to the fact that the polar regions are melting more rapidly and you have to have coal mining going on up there. So let's move on. And um, I'm gonna start with a few, few of the wildflowers. This is a photograph taken in Svalbard, I mean, in uh, Longyearbyen. And it's a plant called Arctic cotton grass. It's a perennial, likes to grow in wet areas. Um, these are the seed heads. And I just found it delightful because it's not like anything I've ever seen. It grows wild, widely in tundra areas. Apparently the Inuit would use these as wicks in their seal oil lamps and um, reindeer you know, feed on the plants. So um, there's a lot more if you look close to the ground because most of the wildflowers are quite small. Um, which is which is what happens in a in a tundra area in an area where you get lots of snow. So it's Arctic catchfly, Svalbard poppy, polar willow, moss campion. These are all photographed in Longyearbyen, and then of course there were some of the birds, and we were there during the nesting season. And these are barnacle geese, um, a couple of parents with some of their chicks, and it was delightful to see them around um, down on the waterfront and. There's a, a main road that goes out of town following the waterfront, and we would see lots of birds. There was a waterway on, on the right side. And one of my favorites were the common eider ducks. And I had a roommate uh, the first two days in, in Longer Bend who was also going on the trip, a lovely Canadian woman. And she happened to know about this eider duck colony about a mile outside of town. And because COVID was still a thing, we spent most of our time outside and also because we wanted to see everything. And we went to visit the eider ducks. Um, here is a, a hen, a female in flight, a uh, beautiful brown uh, model color. And here is a drake with a very different coloration and um, you know, black and white with this curious moss colored, green colored patch on, on the back of his neck. Very, it was just typical coloring of all the males. And there were this area that we went to, which was right on the side of the road. So we were just able to sit on little benches and observe these birds as long as we could handle the cold. Um, there are about 200 pairs of eider ducks that nest there. And the, the hands pluck the eider down from their breasts and line their nests with it. And when they're done and the chicks have hatched and left, um, people can collect that eider down, which is I don't know that they do that now, but it's done for, for stuffing pillows and things like that. And um, it was wonderful to see these hens with their, with their eggs and with their chicks. This hen, I realized later, was actually talking, I don't hear well, um, talking to her eggs. And when I looked at my pictures, when I left and went back, I found that uh, that bit large egg you can see in the front, the chick had already, or the duckling had already started pecking its way out. And my roommate had gotten cold, decided to go back. She said, you're welcome to stay. I thought, no, I'll be courteous. I went back with her. So it's my only regret of the whole trip is I didn't get to stick around and watch these, um, watch these ducklings hatch. So you might ask why there are so many in this one area. And it was a very small area. Well, it's due to the uh, sled dog kennel, which is right next door. And it's for commercial operations. And I think some private, private folks have their dogs kenneled there. And when these dogs set to howl, let me tell you, it, it's, it doesn't scare the birds, but it certainly keeps the foxes away, keeps the polar bears away. And the birds have figured out that it's basically a safe zone. Now when I say it's a safe zone, one has to always be careful because this hen made the mistake of landing in the dog run. 
and a young fellow who came to let his, his charges out to exercise didn't look, because I'm sure it doesn't happen often, to see that there was a duck in there before he let the dog out. And it took about five seconds for that dog to get over there and snag the hen. So just a lesson we all need to be cautious, even when we know we're in a really importantly protected area. So the ship you saw, that, that sailing vessel in the first slide, is, is not the one we sailed on. Uh, but this, the MV Polaris 1, a French, a French vessel, is. And it was um, quite wonderful. Had a crew of a uh, French crew of six. We had our two guides, um, one uh, Samuel LeBlanc, who is French, and then Scott Davis, who actually lives in Moss Landing when he's home. And uh, it had, had cabins for 12 passengers. There were 11 because one gentleman came down with COVID once he got to Longyearbyen, so he wasn't able to come. And we each had our own, our own cabins, which was quite nice. So let's get started on the journey. And um, if you can see here, Longyearbyen is down there on the right. And we essentially crossed the fjord, is fjord and it's called, and went to Skansbukta, and then we went to Imarbukta. Bukta means uh, bay in Norwegian. And I apologize, I don't speak Norwegian. And if I butcher the pronunciation, please be kind. Um, so here we are making our, our first landing in Skansbukta. There's the Polaris out in the in the calm waters of the fjord. And uh, we are taking our Zodiac to land where we made our first landing. And we had the opportunity to see the reindeer. Um, there are some reindeer that hang around in Longer Bend or on the outskirts of Longer Bend, but this is an area with no human habitation. The reindeer, which are what these animals are called in Europe, are essentially the same as the caribou, a name of them on the uh, North American continent. They, however, the Svalbard reindeer separated from the Norwegian reindeer something like 225,000 years ago. So they're much more adapted to the cold. Um, remember, they're a good 600 miles north. They've got shorter legs. They have a slower metabolism. They're less energetic. Um, they have more fur and they can handle the cold better. Although now that we've got some climate change going on, when it rains on the snow, it forms ice and it's making it harder for them to, um, to actually get break through the ice in the winter time to find the tundra to feed on. And um, there's something like 22,000 of them, I believe in Norway and not necessarily that many in, um, in Svalbard. But how can you not love this face? I mean, I just, I just fell in love with reindeer. And maybe that's why we hear that Santa, you know, sleigh is, is uh, carried about by them. But this is the same animal. It's shedding out its white winter, white winter coat. So it's a bit scruffy looking. And in fact, sometimes you could see tufts of hair flying around. They've got these great big, uh, beautiful eyes. This animal is chewing its cud and they were very curious and they were hunted extensively at one point in time. Of course, they're protected now. And so um, they're, they're not afraid of humans. In fact, they're very curious. We then went to our second stop, which was, um, well, we made a landing there too. And here is an iceberg and I'm showing you the Zodiac so you get a sense of scale because these icebergs are massively tall and uh, gives us a sense of who we really are and what our place is here on the planet. This is one of three seals that we actually saw on the trip. And I apologize. I know this day we saw a ring seal and a harbor seal. I'm guessing it's a harbor seal. I'm also guessing that any of the Marine Mammal Center folks in the group can probably tell me exactly what it is, but I don't have enough seal there to know whether it was a, whether it was a, a bearded seal or whether it was a harbor seal, but um, I thought I'd show it because it is a, a, a prime food for polar bears. Their preference is seals, but they need ice flows um, to be able to catch them, catch them, and they don't have them in the in the summertime, or at least not now. So here are just some close-ups of the uh, of the glacier in this particular uh, at Imerbukta, and you've got snow on glacier. All of that is ice. Uh, it's got it, sometimes it got the black striations in it from the scree as the glacier has moved along 
and picked up the soil. And here, I don't know whether you can hear this, but there's not much to hear. It's just running water. Um, and this was... I don't know if that was loud on your end, it was loud on my end, so I couldn't talk through it. But um, that is a, a glacier uh, meltwater stream or river, and, which is normal for this particular glacier, but it was quite fascinating to see. I didn't stick my finger in, I'm sure it was bloody cold, but I was fascinated by the, the, the forms, the swirls formed by the sediment. And this is just a photograph of the water that I took. So, I don't have time to actually go over everything in this presentation, but I wanted to just give you a sense of what ship life was like. So I'll have a few photos scattered throughout. Uh, this was social hour in the evening. And of course, it's lots of daylight uh, in the summertime there. On the right there, with the blonde hair of Scott Davis. We were having drinks and, and uh, snacks. And we would do this every evening when we'd come back from our, our wonderful Zodiac cruises or our landings. So the next, the next stop we made was at a place called Fugelhomain. Maybe that's pronounced like that, maybe not. And as you can see here, it was quite a long uh, transit from our second stop to uh, the next one. And you can see a couple of little, uh, little indentations here where we actually um, stopped for the Magdalena Fjorden, which is this beautiful, beautiful glacier on the Black Black Mountains. It's the same location where the first slide was taken. And uh, I thought it important because I don't know how long these glaciers are going to be around. But to be able to see them and see it covered in snow is a good sign. Um, here's another here's another view uh, further down. And again, if you think about that, that glacier front and the size of a zodiac, this is a pretty massive amount of ice um, with, a, with a high mountain peak in the middle of it there. So our next stop was where we got to see our first polar bear. And we think of polar bears on ice flows and on snow um, because that's generally where they are found. But in the summertime, I'm sure even, even before we started seeing some of the ice melt we're seeing now, that polar bears roved around in the mountains as well. And as I said earlier, their preference is for is for seal. It's a lot of a lot of fat on there. Um, you know, it's good good eating, and uh, the seals don't have a lot of uh, resources to protect themselves or to injure the injure the polar bears. But when they don't have seal, they look for eggs and for chicks. And here is a polar bear in the mountain. Um, uh, uh, to me, it was just quite an extraordinary sight. You've got the bear way up high in this peak and padding along, uh, looking for eggs sniffing. And here, this, this bear is probably checking out scents for um, maybe there's a carcass somewhere, maybe sniffing for another bear. And to give you a sense of scale, there is that same bear up on top of the mountain. And this whole land, this wasn't a landing, it was a Zodiac cruise. So we're sitting offshore in our Zodiac. I'm using a telephoto lens on a, a mirrorless camera. And you can also see how difficult it is to spot polar bears. So we we're very, very thankful that we had wonderful crew who were experienced in that, and we were able to see quite a number of them. Now, I mentioned that the bears eat eggs. They look for duck eggs. Um, these are chicken eggs, but this is our salad. So we have something in common with the polar bears. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of the uh, a, a couple of the stops. They weren't nearly as interesting uh, photographically, and we don't have a time to go absolutely everywhere. But the next lo location we went to is called Idineset, <coughs> excuse me, where we again saw a polar bear. And a neset is a um, a spit or a nose. So I believe that's right. We'll go on, and here we came upon this bear, who was resting up on the snow uh, below the the rocky outcrop there, and um, well, wasn't much going on in his day. And 
you get an idea of where we are relative to the bear. If you look in the large image there, you get to see the um, some footprints over here where the bear has walked up the slope. You can see where it's laying or slid down in uh, different patterns. And um, at a certain point, he decided to come down and check out what was going on down by the shore. And I say he, um, if you look, and I hope you can see my cursor, there is a thin hair, long hair that's hanging down um, back here, which is how you tell a male polar bear from a female. Um, there are also some other differences, uh, the size of the head, the shoulder, but I don't have enough polar bear experience to be able to tell the difference, but I do know that this was a male. And here he comes down to the waterfront to kind of take a look at us, see what's going on. You know, maybe he hasn't seen humans before, hard to say. This bear is actually not tagged. Um, the tagged ones have little white buttons inside their ears, but there was also a walrus in the water nearby. And the walrus kind of perked up when the bear came down, um, didn't seem too terribly concerned, but when the bear made a false lunge, um, the, polar, the walrus decided that it would take off and, and swam away. When we left that site, we were in transit and passed some more ice, another glacier out there, and um, to me, I'm, I'm always fascinated by water and ice formations. And you think about it, it's this crazy substance that we need to live on this planet. It can be a gaseous form, it can be, it can be uh, liquid, it can be solid, and it can form these incredible sculptures. And I'll just bring to your attention here, there's, whoops, there's a little bit of uh, drift ice down at the base of this uh, gl glacier front as we continued on our way. So our next stop um, is a place called Foster Oyan. And an Oyan is a, a group of islands. And here we got to see guillemots and puffins. And the bird on the left is a black guillemot. Uh, looks very much like the pigeon guillemots that we have here, uh, at least on the Monterey Bay area, uh, with red feet and or crimson feet and crimson on the inside of the mouth. And then we have two delightful Atlantic puffins. And when I see birds like this, I understand where Dr. Seuss was coming from. He just had to look at nature as it was and he his, his, let his imagination run, run rampant just like has already happened. Um, both of these birds are members of the auk family. And again, I just find the curiosity of these animals and um, the the, the fact that they're so different than what we get to see around here just really made it exciting to check them out. And they were nesting in this area. Um, there were basalt blocks that had tumbled off the cliffs and they would would create their nests inside the cavities formed by these, these block, block um, tumbled blocks. From there, we crossed the water and went to another area called Alkfjellet. And that last part of that name means mountain. And here we had Brunich's guillemots. It's the second species of guillemot that they have in the Svalbard Islands. And you can see the incredible cliff face here where we've got birds nesting on every ledge face possible and in flight. And 60,000 pairs come here to nest every year. And once their, their chicks have fledged, they take off again. But in the meantime, um, which is part of why I wanted to go on the trip at this particular time of year, you've got this massive, uh, massive collection of birds. And to give you a sense of what it's like, that's the next slide. Guys, okay, so thought this is just about bears. So those cliff faces are are. Uh, really safe because foxes can't get up there. And um, I'm not sure there was a, a, a good location along that mountainside for foxes down below, but sometimes we would have, we would stop and there would be nest sites and then there would be a plain below it and the foxes would run around there and sometimes chicks or eggs would fall and the foxes would take advantage of that. So uh, after we left, after we left Alcafielet, uh, we went and stopped at a location called Toral Neset. And this was an, a viewing of walruses. And 
I love walruses. I have to confess. I know I'm a whale person, but there's something incredibly charming about these very massive beasts who also appear to be quite gentle and were terribly curious. And it's hard to know how many people these different walruses have actually, or any of the animals have seen in their, in their lifetime. Walruses were hunted extensively early on and were almost extirpated in, uh, in the Svalbard area. So uh, they, they were finally, I believe they were, they were finally um, protected and yet they had still not done a great job of recovering but they were just, um, they were protected in 1952. And even with 50 years of protection, they haven't quite recovered to anything close to the, the uh, population that was there before. Um, and it was their ivory that, that we were going for. Um, their tusks are actually teeth and they are used for protection. Um, they are used to help haul themselves out onto ice and they can be used for fighting one another. And these two older bulls had a, uh, had a disagreement, didn't last very long. You can see here that the, um, the tusk of one is smacked into the tusk of the other one. And, uh, you know, they settled the dispute and then they went back to hanging out and resting in the water. Here is an image of our guide, Samuel who is sitting on the, right on the edge of the, of the wa uh, water there. Um, we had gotten out of our zodiacs to do this landing. We walked along the beach and then we all just settled down on the beach to watch the walrus. In fact, all those photographs I showed you already were taken from shore. This one walrus was quite curious and very brave and kept creeping closer and closer to Samuel, who was very experienced and he watched but I noticed in my images that first his right hand was just resting and then he made it into a fist. And then as that he decided the walrus was too close, he just kind of raised it and, and gently, you know, uh, encouraged the walrus to back off, which it, which it did. But to give you an idea of what was really going on, it wasn't a single walrus. It was a whole huddle of walruses. And um, they were just insanely curious. There's our ship in the background. And they would come closer and closer. And then periodically, a, a few of the young ones would go, uh-oh, we're too close. And they would turn around and they would, they would do this. So walruses um, eat largely bivalve mollusks or a variety of clams, and they find them using their whiskers. They like they like these these spits of land that are have a shallow uh, shallow drop off going out into the ocean, because those are good places to um, hang out, find their clams uh, with their whiskers, use their flippers to sort of move the sand away, and then they actually suck the, the clam out of the shell. Um, I read that they use their tusk for, for food, but I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe there are times that they need to use them to excavate the, uh, the clams, but I don't know. And this is a, just a very charming mother and, and a pup. And they stayed at the back of that huddle, which I think mom thought that was a safe place to be. But every time the rest of the group would suddenly turn, they'd go crashing back into this mom and, and her, her youngster. Um, and then they would turn around and they'd come back again. But at one point I was able to see them quite, quite clearly. Uh, that youngster had obviously never seen humans before. Mom is looking uh, with a kind eye and the, the, the young nurse for like two to three years and stay with their mothers for that long period. Um, which is quite interesting. It's, it's certainly way longer than seals that, that get weaned very early on. Um, they have low milk and the mothers help them, you know, learn how to forage. And maybe they do need their tusks and they don't have tusks when they're quite young. So anyways, back to our ship. Um, this is the, the bridge. Uh, the fellow in the orange jacket there is Frederic, who is our captain. Uh, the young woman at the helm is Anna Lori, who is a, a cadet 
at an academy and uh, there were, we had two cadets on board and they had this wonderful opportunity to learn the ropes out at sea, you know, on a wonderful um, voyage like this. Uh, the fellow on the left there with the binoculars is Samuel, who almost always had binoculars plastered to his face, thankfully, because he could find um, polar bears, he could find just about anything. There's Scott in the background talking one of, to one of the guests. And in our travels, we next went on to a place called Braswellbreen, or a glacier called Braswellbreen, because Breen means glacier. And it is the glacier front of the Osfana ice cap. And the Osfana ice cap is the third largest in the world. It's 3,000, just under 3,000 square miles. And this glacier front is 100 miles long. So when you look at this, it makes me think of seeing the back of a blue whale the first time. You think maybe you've seen the whale, but you haven't got close. So this is just a postage stamp of that whole um, that whole glacier front. And I read some things that back in 2015, there was a huge uh, melt going on of the, of the ice cap. And sometimes, I mean, the, the, the glacier itself is called the Sudden Swell Glacier. And I think that this melting and, and advancing and retreating is maybe more common with this particular one, but they saw the melt going on from satellites. And there was, I guess, a lot of concern about that. Um, the two or lower images are just some, uh, I'll call it portraits of the of the glacier front. Uh, I find the sculptures to be absolutely fascinating. We've got like black lightning strike on the left, which is um, the, sort of the, the silt having been caught in there with, you can see the various layers on the right, you see the blue ice, which is compressed ice, which gets compressed over time. Um, and uh, the air pockets in the, in the snow and the ice actually get squeezed out to make that beautiful color. And here is just a view close up of uh, a waterfall. And there were several of them on this section of the ice face, which I'm told is normal in the summertime. But again, we may be seeing um, more of a melt than in the in past. Just another glimpse of uh, ship life where we were served, you know, we'd have our breakfast, lunch, and dinner and some snacks. And uh, we had a wonderful French chef. So the meals were always different and kept us going. This is one of my very favorite stops along the way. It's an area called Peshloya, and Oya is an island. And here we got to see um, some from my bucket list. So we had a mother polar bear and her cub, and we watched them for two and a half hours from the safety of our Zodiac as they swam from island to island, little islands. Uh, they would swim, they would get out, they would dry off, they would walk around, they might look for some eggs, and then they would go back and repeat that again um, for two and a half hours. You can see the cub, you know, I would look at that expression and say, maybe it's not altogether happy about the swim, but these were short swims and polar bears have to learn how to swim because, and they have to learn even more now because there's less ice, but a polar bear can swim 700 kilometers. And one of the things that I've learned is that um, there's something like, I think 2000 polar bears in Norway, 300 of those are in Svalbard, but the Barents Sea population is something like 3,000. And I'm not altogether sure how they separate that out because the polar bears from Svalbard have been found to actually cross the, on a, like an ice bridge to Franz Josef Land, which is a Russian archipelago to the east, um, to have their cubs on islands there. And these bears don't den like the brown bears or the, or the black bears. Um, but they, they uh, you know, they'll just have their cubs and they have one or two at a time. So they get out of the water. Here's mom uh, drying off her, her snow towel. Uh, the, the cub was very curious. I had, again, never, I'm sure had never seen humans before and spent quite a lot of time looking at us. Her mom is rolling around and you can see this gray area, which is one of her nipples. 
Uh, the cub is still uh, is still nursing. The cub finally decided to imitate mom and and dry off. And um, after two and a half hours, the bears finally climbed up to the top of a small mountain, the top of the hill on this little island, and went over the far side. Some of the guests were cold, even though we were in Mustang suits that the, the ship gives us, which is a requirement of the Norwegian government. And we went back to the ship to warm up. But Scott had an intuition that there might be something more going on. So he took the Zodiac back and he was correct. He radioed the boat and he said, get ready, I'm coming back to pick you up. And we Zodiac back and lo and behold, the mother and the cub had gone over to the other side where they found a walrus carcass or what I call walrus jerky and they were feeding on it or snacking on it. Um, I'm sure that they had fed on this before. Um, it's obviously been there for some time. We could see where it had been dragged up uh, from closer to the shore. And in this image, that cub was got ticked off at mom. Uh, it had started to feed on something in that spot and she poked her head over there and the cub just basically said, hey, back off, it's mine. And said, I mean it. And mom kind of deferred for a moment but it looks like there must have been something with perhaps more meat or more fat on it. And she decided it was hers anyways. And the cub kind of had to take it in stride, but then got his or her own bit to feed on. Um, and we got to watch them um, as, they, as they fed. And I think there's nothing more exciting to me than watching wildlife actually live, feed, do the things that they do to um, for their own survival. And obviously that walrus was finger licking good. And mom decided she would go for some uh, of the ribs and the cub is there. And we spent an hour watching them feed. They finally got sated, they sat down. Um, we went back to the ship for dinner at dinner and then we came back and we watched them some more. So it was hard to get enough of the, of the two. And here is, a typical dinner menu, a little chalkboard, and uh, Zoe, who you'll meet later on, our stewardess, uh, would put this together for each meal in French, in English, with a little decoration. And uh, so we always knew what it was that we were that we were being fed. The bears, the last bears we saw. Um, well, actually, maybe I didn't even include all the bears. The last bears I showed you were over here at 11, but we have to skip and we come along to now 15. Not that you can ever get too many polar bears, but I only have so much time for this presentation. And we stopped at Negribreen. And Breen, as you learned, is a glacier. Negri, in this case, was actually named after somebody whose last name was Negri, but it's also um, Negro or black, and it was a black glacier. And I put this slide in here, which I don't find to be that exciting myself, except that it was the one area that we saw lots of drift ice. And um, we didn't do a Zodiac cruise. We, do, we certainly didn't do a landing, but we did our observations from the, the deck of the ship. And I imagine, uh, I don't know enough to know if this was considered the the, the red Probably not. I th would think that would be very difficult to navigate, but we did get to see some of that, um, some of that drift ice. And here you get to see um, the glacier front. This whole white area here is snow covered glacier. You've got this large outcropping and then you've got a smaller one. And I just believe it's the way the ice moves through the valleys and, and builds up as it gets out to the ocean front. Um, here is the, the Black Glacier with lots of sediments have been incorporated into it. Again, to me, quite extraordinary. And if you look closely, this curved white line is the top of the glacier um, covered in snow. And here's another view um, further along because this is quite a large area and there are probably multiple glaciers in there. And if you look down um, kind of just to the right of middle and you see that deep blue, here is a close up. And to me, it looks like marble and it's just nature's um, art is spectacular. We just need to appreciate it. So you've got the black, you've got that, that deep blue condensed ice and um, the rest all swirling. And here is Zoe 
our stewardess. And this is a pretty classic polar um, tradition where a drink is being made with a piece of glacier ice or a piece from an iceberg. So, um, and Zoe was absolutely delightful. She, she took care of um, many of our needs, our, our serving needs. After Negrebreen, we crossed over the water to uh, an area called Dolorit Neset, another spit, and another area for observing walruses. We'd made a landing, we got out, we climbed up onto this, this low rocky area to look at a huddle or a pod of walruses down on the beach, mostly just chilling out. And that we had the opportunity to uh, observe their behavior. Um, you know, we've got the guys, a little sparring going on in the background, a little, maybe a little uh, territorial, you know, discussion. Guy in front is busy scratching himself. And they're not the most, um, they, they can move relatively fast on land, but uh, they're really more suited to uh, water and they don't go very far from the shore. So every once in a while, but I found this to be absolutely, um, and I, I apologize for the word touching because it's not meant to be a pun, but this pair of walruses just lying side by side and the gentle way that they are touching their flippers from one to the other um, just was, was, was charming. It was quite charming. And I know it's a little bit of anthropomorphizing to say that. And here is, is more, I, I've got my photographer's hat on, so I'm allowed to anthropomorphize. This guy looks like he had a tough night, you know, got a hangover, maybe had too many drinks. And um, here he is, a little bit exposed there with his girlfriend. And um, I would say it probably was a long night. And then I found the next thing he did again to be quite extraordinary because here's this big blubbery animal, um, doesn't have hands, has got these kind of awkward flippers. They're good for getting around and good for apparently uh, finding clams, et cetera. And he's just very gently touching the tip of his penis. And I guess he decided that it was still there. It was okay, he with withdrew it. And then he went back to sleep. So we went from walruses, went around uh, another quite a long uh, journey down to the, around the tip of Spitsbergen and up the far side, the Western side there to an area called Hitvika, where we got to see some more birds and a uh, beautiful location, uh, quite rocky. Um, these are little auks. And if you look along the mountain side over on the right in the back there, you see another glacier. You know, this glacier is just about everywhere. And these are little auks, the same family as the Gilmots and the Atlantic puffins, quite curious shaped little birds. And they fly around in little flocks. So here we have Scott. We're at a base of a cliff, which I haven't shown you, but these birds are are hanging out. I think they've been nesting in the cliffs. And then there's a, the flattened terrain be beneath the cliff. Scott is standing out, looking away from where most of the birds are. And yes, he has a rifle, which whenever we did a landing, both of our guides carried a rifle, never had to use it, but you never know when you might surprise a polar bear. And that's not a good thing. So I'm sure the first thing would be to scare the bear rather than to shoot it, but just to make sure we were well protected. So Scott is scanning the distance looking for a fox. And after a bit, he received a radio call that Samuel had been successful. And we all, you know, hightailed it from the little ox, put our gear back and went, you know, over this very rocky and tundry ter terrain, difficult to walk on, but almost running until we came to where Samuel was with the Arctic fox. Now, he had us sit down. He told us, you sit here, you sit here, et cetera, which we did. And we looked for the fox and I couldn't find it. So I motioned to Samuel and I, you know, where is it? And he took a photograph and showed me on his LCD screen. And one, I've been looking far too far away. The fox was right in front of us. And I've enhanced this photo. The fox was in the shade. 
and with its winter with its summer coat on um, was kind of camouflage. So absolutely stunningly beautiful animal. And initially was lying there with its eyes closed and lying there with its eyes open. And pretty soon, like all the rest of the animals, we were now the subject of the of the people watching uh, experience. And um, there, there it, it was just a real gift to be able to sit there in the presence of this small carnivore um, being observed, trying to tell, you know, whether we we're, we're something to be concerned about or not. And the next thing, the fox sat up and gave a big yawn. And that could have been because we're woken up and that's what you do sometimes when you wake up. But a yawn is also um, known as a calming signal, particularly for canines, but I've seen horses use them as well. And it's a way of saying, I don't want any trouble. I'm not being aggressive, which I think may have been what this fox was doing because it had just been staring at us, which can be considered um, a form of aggression, and then proceeded to look at us again. Um, but in the meantime, had let us know that it didn't have any in any aggressive uh, intentions. And then shortly after this moment, the fox scrambled down off the, the cliffside there, uh, the little slope, and galloped across the, the plain back out to the seashore where Samuel had initially seen it carrying an egg in its mouth. And even though I would have loved to see the fox feeding and we didn't, it was still an absolutely um, spectacular encounter. And got rewarded with a wonderful dessert made by our French chef. So we're now approaching uh, Longyearbyen. You know, it's, it's near the end of our 10 day trip. And we stopped at a place called Camp Millar and there were some outbuildings there. Um, but in this case, I just wanted to show you more reindeer. We haven't had reindeer for a while. And here are a couple of adult males with a great rack of antlers each. And they were being pursued by an, uh, an Arctic skua, otherwise known as a parasitic Jaeger. And these large birds nest on the ground, just in the plane like that. And um, if people got too close to them, they would get dive bombed. And when the reindeer got too close, they got dive bombed. So um, I think that the two of these boys had, had started to have a little spat, but they were way too close to the nest. The skua stopped that altogether. And here's just a, um, a portrait of this beautiful buck with this fantastic rack still covered in velvet. He's shed out most of his winter coat, so he'll be brown pretty soon. And um, just a very elegant beast with a beautiful muzzle and those beautiful large eyes. And this is Anna Lori, who you saw at the helm. Here she is in her Mustang suit, um, our Zodiac driver, and she's wearing her uh, Norwegian Viking hat cap. So our last, our last landing um, before we headed back to Longyearbyen was at a place called Alcornet. And again, we got to see reindeer and this was something else on my bucket list, which was a mother and a, a calf, a reindeer calf. And there was one, one guest on the passenger on the boat I would tell him, which I, I don't think I told you guys all of them, but I would tell him all my bucket list wishes. And at some point he said, I think Amazon is doing special deliveries for you. At any rate, um, it was just wonderful to see this mother and her, and her youngster. Um, here they are grazing. You can see they've still got quite a lot of their winter coats on. And you know, they're eating the tundra and the flowers and whatnot. But then this mother did something quite extraordinary. She picked up a bone and uh, it was a broken bone and she mouthed it. I'm not sure whether this was a ritual of grief that she knew this animal, whether she was getting nutrients, whether she was tasting it. I talked to several people, nobody had seen this before. Nobody had any idea what she might've been doing. But um, you know, again, it was a, a window into a special moment in the life of a reindeer. And then we observe them as she and her, her calf are both scratching. I'm sure that that molting, um, shedding coat is just incredibly itchy. 
And the more you scratch, the more you loosen and get it out in a hurry. And, um, you know, as, as always, the babies learn from their, from their mothers. So a little portrait of this calf who is just the sweetest thing and somehow looks remarkably like a, a bovine or ca calf. Um, still lots of fluffy white coat, but I'm sure he'll be shedding out or she will be shedding out fairly soon. And back in Longyearbyen at the dock was our last sighting. <laughs> and this dinosaur was courtesy of Zoe again um, with uh, adding some entertainment. I think she did some of that in her Parisian life. And um, with that, I just wanna extend a big thank you to everyone for your attention. And uh, thank you to Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris, who put on a, a wonderful, wonderful journey. Scott Davis and Samuel LeBlanc, who did just yeoman's work, finding us um, all of these wonderful animals to see. And the crew of the MV Polaris One, who were also stupendous. And I've mentioned Anna Craven, the travel agent here, because while we were circumnavigating Spitsbergen, uh, the SAS pilots went on strike and all of the, the SAS flights out of Longyearbyen, actually all the SAS flights period, were canceled. And so for the last few days when we had internet, and maybe the last two days, Scott spent a huge amount of his time on email with Anna, who is a travel agent who works for Cheesemans, um, trying to, to reschedule everyone. Fortunately, the owner of the Polaris One um, had another ship in port and he brought in a charter flight for us. People couldn't get out. They were walking down along the waterfront with their luggage to the cruise ship that was in port, hoping that there might be a free cabin and they could get out. Otherwise, they had no way to get out. So we took this, uh, this charter flight. Uh, other people were able to get on it with us as well. As I think it held 300 passengers. And we flew to Paris. We spent a night in Paris. And then we all went on our own separate ways through travel chaos. And um, with that, uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to um, do my best to answer them. And there's my photography website and another one for um, a book project that um, I'm working on as well. So thanks so much, Jody. We have some, uh, we have a lot of audience participation over here. So we have a, a few questions, if you don't mind, uh, we can go through them. Um, so there's a there's a few similar ones. I'll I'll try to go by by category and sort it out here. Um, so I guess first category is we had a lot of a lot of walrus or walrus interest. Um, so I think that the a couple of them had to do with kind of the male versus female walruses. Um, can you kind of go into any any physical differences between males and females? Uh, one person asked the female walruses have tusks. So just kind of any defining factor between the two. They all have tusks. I will, I will go into it a little bit. And I will say that um, I'm primarily a photographer and um, I done my best to, um, to try and research this, but I, I, I don't consider myself an expert whatsoever about, um, about the species. Cause I've, I, I can tell you a lot about whales, <laughs> but um, I've only seen walruses twice in my life and, and the same with polar bears, but both the males and the females have tusks. Um, they're not born with them, they're teeth and they grow and they get larger over time. Um, sometimes you'll see that they've broken them off a bit and um, the males are larger than the females. So it's a matter of, you know, I, I couldn't, I could not tell you in that huddle, that, that group of them out there, um, if there were females in there, if they were males, I'm going to assume that because there was at least one mother and a and a pup, that there were probably other females in that group. I know, you know, with some species, you know, the males go off and do their thing, and then you have the female groups. Um, and I'm afraid I don't know that about the walrus, but I do know that there was a mother pup there, um, and there were a number of juveniles. Makes sense. And then this is a, a sadder walrus question, but. Uh... So when the when the mama and cub uh, polar bear were dragging up the walrus carcass to the uh, to the shore, 
did it seem like they were they were like did, did that seem indicative that they were planning for a future meal what were they um what, did it look like they were eating some now and saving some for later or do you think it was more of a, just a convenience thing so i guess um i wasn't clear on that we did not watch them pull the carcass up um but we could see an indent in the snow of where the carcass had been lower to the closer to the water than it was when we were there. So I can't tell you whether that particular polar bear moved the carcass up. I would assume that over time that some other polar bears had also fed because they do shift around. We saw another mother with two cubs swimming across quite a, a wide expanse of water and they were very young cubs. Um, so I, I know that they move around and, you know, as I said, we watched them for, I guess, an hour feeding. And at this point, that carcass was pretty, it was jerky. It was pretty dried out. So there's only so much they can get off it at a given time. Um, I'm sure they'll be back, but, um, I hope that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, and then in the background, I think that uh, I think that you've inspired a few people to go to Svalbard. So there's uh, there's a uh, one question. Uh, can you put your the the slide up that you had in the beginning? That was like the whole map of your entire trip. Um, I can do that, but I'm going to have to. Um, let's go to here. That's no, that one doesn't want to do it. this one. Oh, actually, you know what? I have to do it this way. Um, sorry. No, you're good. All right. So should have done it that way. All right. So, and the question is. That was, that was the question. They wanted to see the entire map so they can, they could plan out their tour too. I think, um, it, it, I think there was one, a couple slides forward from now that had like the different spots that you hit. It was the one that was drawn. I think there was uh, like a marker drawn on it or something. This yeah, one? there you go. Yeah, I think that's what they were looking for. Um, and then a similar question: How long was your whole tour? How long? How long was the trip? Yeah, um, we did this. We circumnavigated in ten days, so our voyage was a ten-day trip. And I was there for two days. Uh, I, you know, chose to come early, which I do for a couple of reasons. One of which is I don't trust flights to get me where I need to go at the last minute. <laughs> um, and, and I also like to sort of deal with the exhaustion of travel and have a little time to, you know, acquaint myself with the place. But I'd also been to Longer Bin for maybe a couple of days, um, a few years earlier, I think it was 20, 2019, when I did a trip to Franz Josef Land and we actually set out from, um, from, from Longyear Bin. So I knew that I wanted to go back and see the area and uh, just get to spend a little bit of time there. But the but the journey itself, the the boat cruise was was ten days. Although I do think that Cheeseman's also offers a fourteen day trip. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think you've inspired some folks. Um, and then as far as so on, on the the Arctic fox that you were showing towards the end, about how big was that? Was it like the size of a small dog, or what, what would you estimate size wise? Um, that's a good question. A, a, a medium sized dog. I mean, it, it, it has very long legs. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'll Does, get is it about the same size as like a, as like a red fox in, in this part of the world or is it, uh, it's, it, you know, I was just so intrigued staring yeah. at the little fox, but I think Hmm. I think it was about the size of, um, you know, I need to do this so that I can actually get it to be open to, oh, sorry. Hello. It's, let's try that. If you hit the slideshow tab up there, then you should be able to put a play from Karen. Uh, sorry, which one? If I so go to, if you if you click on slideshow like towards the middle of your screen, 
I, oh, yeah, that works too. You no, know, it takes it takes me back to the beginning as when I go to slideshow. I, I, I meant like there's a, there's a tab next to animations and transitions, like not not where you are, but if you go to it, if you're back in your PowerPoint, Over yes, here? slideshow, yeah, and then play from current slide on the left. Oh, and then and then if you well, you'd have to go back to the, the original work. one and then hit that, but I I did I went to play from currents. Oh, yeah. So now it's it's got you back there. Yeah, it's uh. Not the most user friendly. Okay, my my apology, but thank you for no worries. something. Play from current slide. Okay, brilliant. Um, it's much longer legs than the foxes we have here, and I'm going to say that it's um, maybe twice the size of of the foxes that we have in America. You know, smaller oh, wow. than a coyote, larger than a fox. And I makes sense. Yeah. Are there um, another and thank you. Uh, another question is uh, kind of on the natives. Are there still any any native people that are hunting the animals that are that are that you saw there? Uh, still hunting? Yes. Um, I'm not sure there are any native people there. Um, you know, the population that I that I'm aware of are in uh, Longyear Bend, like maybe about 2,400 people and, you know, several hundred people in Barentsburg. Barentsburg is, they're all, they're Russians. It's like a Russian community and um, it's not military, but it's, it's kind of not exactly civilian. And I don't know who goes there if they're not Russian. I mean, I, I read up a little bit on the political scenario of, of Svalbard and it's, it's been very mixed over time and, a uh, bit confusing. And while it's under the sovereignty of the Norwegian government, the Swedes and the Russians have some kind of connection and stuff like that. And I believe that most of the, I, I don't know if there even were native people in Svalbard. You know, it was discovered, quote unquote, um, like 1596 or something like that. And the first thing that happened is that, you know, all the white folks who got there started hunting all the, all the animals. So, you know, the polar bears were almost extirpated for their, their coats, the walrus for their um, ivory. And um, I'm sure they went for bird eggs as well, but um, I'm not, uh, and I apologize, I'm not aware of native population. I mean, the people who are living in Svalbard now are probably largely, there's some having to do with the coal, the coal industry that's still there, but they're mostly for tourism and, you know, maintaining the shops and, and construction and uh, research scientists and stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, uh, that, um, I, I took the, the long boat journey one time from like northern Norway and Tromsø up to Svalbard, and unless there was a land bridge way, way, way back, then uh, I can't imagine the people getting there before uh, big boats. Um, okay, so another question was on the um, the the laws about interact or interacting with uh, nature. So, like, how close was the zodiac allowed to get to different species, or were there did they not really fill you in on that? Um, I can tell you what we did. I don't know what the laws are. Um, we. I know that that you can't fly drones. <laughs> and I know that um, we were able to get, and I'm, I'm certain that we were following regulations. Um, we were very cautious around polar bears. We never did landings. If we knew there was a polar bear, we did uh, Zodiac cruising and we stayed in our Zodiacs. And uh, safety was always, always first. With the walruses on the beach, we were able to get relatively close. Um, they're not, you know, they're not aggressive. You just have to make sure you stay out of their way and you're not between, you know, a walrus and the, and the water. Um, it just, uh, you know, and, the, and with the, the reindeer, it was more a matter of, you know, you don't want to scare the animals because they, Anytime you do that, they, you know, they're, they're using up more energy and they've got to feed more and things like that. But, you know, they would come relatively close. Um, and I know in, in Longer Bend, where the reindeer are, are more accustomed to people, they're just walking around in town, you know, 
So, um, and, and people don't even think twice about it. Makes sense. Apparently, um, reindeer don't think twice about it either. So, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then uh, on the, I guess this is a this is a, a whale society. There was a, a question about: Did you see any whales on the voyage? <laughs> That's a really good question. We saw one minke whale, and I did not put the photograph in there because it was quote unquote not a photograph. I mean, it was quite at quite a distance. And um, no, I think you know it's more likely to see whales in the Barents Sea. And I know that uh, a couple of your members are going to be going this year and. Maybe they'll get lucky and see more whales than we did, but um, no, we that that's all we saw. Makes sense. And then, as far as uh, as far as seals go, uh, about how many did you? Uh, how many like individual seals did you see? I know you mentioned you saw. I think it was two or three different types, but three. We three had, total seals. And I'm not even sure I saw I saw all three, um, but you know we had a sightings list, and um, there was one bearded seal. I think one ring seal. I don't think I saw the ring seal and one uh, one harbor seal. So there were not a lot. And um, I can't really answer for you why that is the case. Um, but no, we didn't see many seals. Makes sense. And then there was one on kind of the impacts of climate change. Um, so uh, in the animals that you saw, where, did you notice any any distress or anything that, that could have been caused by um, by the melting ice, or, or do you think it was uh, not not too bad in the area that you were in? So, and I apologize because my hearing um, is just really bad. Did I see any signs of stress in the animals? Is that what? The yes. Was? Yeah. Yeah. So, did, you, did it seem like they were suffering at all, or did they seem relatively healthy? I'm going to sort of go out on a limb and say I didn't see any signs of stress, but again, I have to caution that I'm, um, you know, it's the second time I've seen polar bears. It's the second time I've seen, you know, walruses. It's the first time I've seen an Arctic fox. Um, judging from my, my experience with wildlife, which is extensive, um, the bears looked well fed, the walruses were well fed, uh, the fox had you know, had been carrying an egg in its mouth shortly before it looked, you know, it wasn't mangy. I mean, the animals, the animals all looked healthy. So I think in at least the ones we saw, we did see, you know, there were times in areas where we saw bones, um, you know, teeth uh, of, of animals, but animals are going to die um, of old age. They're going to, they're going to die from predation. So it's hard to say. It didn't seem like there were some vast, vast number. What I did see, and I've sort of seen this in different forms all over the world, is plastic. You know, um, I believe where we had the mother and, and cub, um, our crew all came out in a Zodiac and they, further down the shore from where the mother and the cub were, um, was a bunch of, you know, nets and, and other plastic debris. And they tried to gather up a bunch of it into the Zodiac and take it back to the ship. But we also were in one location where there were birds nesting and you could see bits of um, like plastic twine and stuff uh, on the ground, which had been picked up by the Muniz's as nesting material. So you know, climate change is a threat. It's not as easy to see as plastic pollution, and plastic pollution is just a disaster. It's horrible. Yeah, and anywhere in the world you go, it's uh, it's so bad. Yeah. Um, and as far as the uh, as far as the polar bear tagging that you mentioned, uh, did did you get any any information on that? As far as um, how do they do it? Um, how many are tagged? Anything like that? How, how information like how do they physically tag them do they do they have to tranquilize them and, and go up there or what would, um presumably i mean i i don't think you can tag a polar bear without it i uh i didn't we didn't get any information on that and um the tags you know i should have i should have included just a, a close-up the tags were like white buttons in the ear so presumably they are um you know, tag goes through the ear and there's something inside that button. I don't know whether it actually transmits information or not, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to tranquilize the bear to be able to 
um, to put tags in like that. Makes sense. Um, and then on that on that one reindeer that you saw that was holding the bone, what, did it hold it for a while, kind of like a dog, or did it just pick it up and drop it? What was the what was the uh, the activity like, like? Yeah, like maybe a minute or two. I mean, she kind of picked it up and mouthed it and changed position. It wasn't a terribly long time. And I went back and I checked in my images of that, so it wasn't a long time, but it was just a very curious, um, very curious thing. Makes sense. And, and the last question you touched upon briefly, but can you can you go over the um, different colors in the glaciers again, like the, the black versus the dark blue versus the white and how those are formed? So white ice basically has air in it, which is I do photography for a number of reasons. I love it. I'm a very visual person and it helps me remember things. I have a crap memory. <laughs> I mean, I've been to Antarctica several times and I've heard all about ice over and over and over again. But I'm gonna give you just a very poor rendition of it because I, I just don't retain that stuff very well. But, but the white ice, effectively has has air, air in it and and that's what keeps it white as it gets compressed over time so the blue ice is older ice um the air actually gets squeezed out of it and then it and then it looks blue and i'm going to say it probably isn't blue it's probably reflecting the light but um and and there's in the movement of glaciers which are scouring the terrain they pick up um the scree and you know loose bits and things like that and then it it seems that they get you know that it, that it moves around almost like um i think about geology and you look at a, a land at land sometimes and you've got these sedimentary layers and they're they're waved because sometimes they get pushed up here and then sometimes they get pushed down and i think that must happen with the ice in the in the glaciers as well because the movement is not um it, it's variable throughout. So sometimes you get you, you get things, you know, diving down, you get layers in different ways, but that that's the best I can do. Thank you. That was that, that's super helpful. And uh, and and thank you so much for answering all the questions. I know you had uh, I've been I've been sitting here for for half an hour peppering you. So I, I know that's uh, that, that's that's a lot of effort. So uh, yeah, thanks so much. I'll, I'll pass it back to Susan. I don't know if we had any uh, any closing remarks or anything. Yeah, I just want to say, Jody, I all I can say, I'm I know I'm not the only one who has just been totally transported. And I would say that it's the next best thing to actually being there and maybe being there as well. So uh just so appreciate how you've um just portrayed the web of life. And uh, the good news for everybody is that Jody will be back in October. And then she's going to take us to the Arctic, which uh, I guess would would be a little bit west. <laughs> anyway, Jody, thank you so very much. It's it's just been spectacular, and uh, we'll be posting the recording link to our site. And uh, thank you, and th thank you, everyone. We will be back in June for um, a look at sharks off of our own coast here. So hope you can join us. Thank you. So, and thank you guys. And if I can just say one thing, cause I just saw a comment that somebody said about, about getting calcium from bones oh, yeah. that um, reindeer didn't actually chew on the bone. She just mouthed it. And so I do not see how um, you can't, can't absorb a lot of calcium just from sucking on a bone. <laughs> so it's still a bit of a mystery, but a, a good attempt. And so. I, I actually said, noted how you, you perhaps, whether anthropomorphizing or not, how perhaps it had been an ancestor. So yeah. such a beautiful, um, beautiful thought. And again, the connectedness of, of life. So <laughs> and I love your humor. There was so much in the background. I was laughing. So I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> and, and then you will be posting a link at some point in time of the recording. Yes.
Oh yeah, it'll it'll be up um, on our site within a couple days, give or take. It might be sooner. Great. So, hey, um, have a great time and uh, your travels ahead, and uh, we'll we'll see you in October. Thank you. I'm I'm going to Mongolia next. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. Good. We've got lots of good talks ahead with Jody. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.